Thank, thanks for the introduction. Um, this is my first year at this meeting, so it's pretty exciting to see this many kind of you know, patients and advocates energized and wanting to learn more. Um, so as, as a result, my understanding is this is a fairly informal affair, which is great because I'm a fairly informal guy. So um, what we'll do is, I don't anticipate, quite frankly, that this is going to take the whole time allotted. If it does, great. If it doesn't, that means more time for coffee drinking and lunch eating. Um, also, though, uh, I'm more than happy if you, you know, I'm saying something and it sounds crazy or you have a question about it, just call a timeout and, you know, we can talk about it. So this is me. Uh, my name is Dan Bowles, and I work here at the uh, University of Colorado where I see thyroid, advanced thyroid cancer patients, salivary gland can, uh, patients, and then uh, squamous cell carcinoma, the head and neck. So, you know, we always have to have a conflict of interest slide. So it's not really a conflict of interest, but I think thyroid cancer is a lousy disease. You know, I can't tell you how many, and I suspect some of the people in this room, when someone was originally diagnosed, whether it was you or a loved one, you know, someone said, oh, thyroid cancer, don't worry, it's a, it's, if you're going to get a cancer, it's a good cancer to get. I don't know if you guys have heard this one, but that's not true. It's a lousy cancer. I've never, I've never met a good cancer. So I think it's a lousy cancer, and that's why I'm glad that you guys are out here, and that's why I'm happy to talk about it. All right. So the format will be as such. So we're going to cover just a little bit of basics in terms of some biology about advanced thyroid cancers. I want to review some of the completed studies, kind of thinking about them in terms of molecular pathways, which is kind of how we think about things now uh, in terms of advanced thyroid cancers. Then we'll talk about some uh, ongoing molecular studies based on molecular pathways um, and things that might be coming down the road. So um, some abbreviations, I think it's always good to you know, get some of these things out of the way. So these are things I'll be saying. So you know, D, I think most of you guys know these, but if not, here they are. So differentiated thyroid cancer, you know, with DTC, medullary, A, uh, MTC, anaplastic, ATC, a radioactive iodine, I think it's REI, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, which of course will come up a lot, our TKIs, response rate. This is a funny one. Do you guys, who, who knows the formal definition of a response rate? All right, two of us, which is good. So when you're looking at, one of the things I think is confusing about medical oncology, which, you know, I'm a chemo doctor is we have all these funny terms that don't necessarily mean a whole lot until you kind of learn the exact definition. So when we are talking about studies, we always have this thing called response rate, which basically means when we look at someone's CAT scan or MRI, you know, not a radioactive iodine scan, so not a whole body scan, but we're talking about this is something where you can get a cross section of someone. You have to have something that shrinks, or in this situation you have a sum of a bunch of different tumors and they have to shrink by a total of 30%. So let's say someone has a tumor in uh, his lung and he has one in his liver. I might measure those on a CAT scan before he starts a study and then two months later, I'll repeat the CAT scans and I'll measure, you know, if it went from this to this or this to that, you add up those sums and if it shrinks more than, thir or if it shrinks 30% or more, we call it a response. So that's the formal definition. It's this thing called a resist, R-E-C-I-S-T, measurement. And the way that we do, we do it like that, so that when I measure something in, in Aurora, it's the same as how someone measures something if they're in Boca Raton, Florida, or if they're in Milan in Italy. So that's how we standard things across the board. But it makes, yeah. It, it, I mean, all depends on, it all depends on the math. So if you had something that was, we'll make up crazy numbers. So if you had something that was 10 centimeters in size, right? Something that, I mean, that's really big. So if you had something that was 10 centimeters in size, and that shrunk 70%, so that shrunk to three centimeters, and everyone, you'd come to clinic and we'd be giving high fives, but we'd be pretty excited. Um, at the same time, if the other thing you're measuring went from two centimeters and actually grew by three centimeters, if you add them all up, that sum is still way less, you know, it still would meet that 30% threshold. And so we call that a, a clinical response. So when you guys are looking at studies, you know, you're look, reading about the serafinib study or the linvatinib study or any of these other things that are coming down the pipeline, that's what we talk about. When you read response rates, it's that kind of arbitrary 30% cutoff that we use to define it. And it's just, like I said, so that when I compare something here in Denver, it's the same as some guy in L.A. or anywhere else in the world. That's a great question, though. So it ends up, you know, it's, it, it doesn't always tell the whole story, but it's, you know, it's a formalized way that we all compare things. So that's, that's one thing to talk about. 
And then the other thing that comes up a lot, particularly in the world of medical oncology, so, you know, fortunately, I, you know, for most thyroid cancer patients, they never have to come to see me um, because when they come to see me, it's because of the radioactive iodine and surgery or radiation, those things are no longer working. So we think about, you know, this concept of progression-free survival. So progression-free survival basically means how long does it take for someone's cancer to get worse? There are some formal definitions for what we call that. It's based on that same thing called resist, which is basically you take that sum of your measurements, add them up, and it grow by 20% or more in total. So when we're going to be talking about some of the newer drugs that have been tested or in, are in trial, when we'll be talking about progression-free survival, what that means is, you know, things, how long did it take for things to grow by a sum of 20%? And then the other thing I want to just make sure we cover is uh, clinical trials in a nutshell, right? So when we hear about different types of trials, I know you guys probably read about, you know, we have phase ones and twos and threes and fours even. What, what the heck does that mean? So here's the way I think most of us think of it. It's, is, so phase one studies are usually kind of brand spanking new drugs, or they're older drugs in new combinations. So I have new tyrosine, I'm a, I'm a startup company, I have new tyrosine kinase inhibitor A. I really wanna see, you know, find out what's the right dose of it, what are the side effects, does it work? But mostly, what's the right dose and what are the right side, what are the side effects? That's a phase one study. The goal of phase one study is not technically to find out whether the drug works or not. It's to figure out what's the right dose of the drug for future studies and what's the side effect profile. So you don't see a ton of thyroid cancer specific phase one studies, just because there aren't that, that many patients um, to drive you know, enough information to learn about that medication. So instead, Phase one, and I do a lot of phase one studies um, over at, uh, at CU. Instead, the thyroid cancer patients who end up going on to phase one studies, they're usually, thyroid, they're usually studies that are, are enrolling a lot of different people. So you might have some people with lung cancer, some people with ovarian cancer, someone with you know, head and neck cancer, something like that. So phase two studies are typically more specific. So they're really, that would be where you find something that's kind of more tailored specifically for someone with thyroid cancer. So you know, let's say going back to, uh, I'm that biotech company and I did my phase one study with my new TKI and it looks, you know, it has no side effects amazingly and, you know, we know the right dose and you know, we're super pumped up about it. And we think thyroid cancer would be a, a good thing to test it in. So that's where you'd find your phase two study. You might give it to um, a bunch of people who had previously had serafinib or one of these other TKIs and just see how it works. And so I'm still biotech company, uh, uh, company and I still have TKIA and now my phase two study looked really good. I had a bunch of those kind of arbitrarily defined response rates. My progression-free survival was way better than I would have anticipated. You know, it took longer for people's cancers to get worse or grow. I'd be pretty excited. And I'd say, all right, now we need to do a phase three study. A phase three study is basically where you compare it to standard of care. So you, I'm saying, hey, is my new drug A gonna be better than what's already out there? So if I were you know, trying to develop a new drug for say differentiated thyroid cancer, papillary, follicular, um, and I wanted, to, I wanted to go up against the big dogs, I'd say maybe the, the phase three study I would do is I'd say for new people with, uh, with for patients with a differentiated thyroid cancer that is radioactive iodine refractory, I'm going to compare my, my new drug A to serafinib, first line setting. Serafinib, I think, would be standard of care. That's the comparator. My new drug, drug A, and we see what happens. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so if you have a positive, and the rules uh, I'll get on what gets things approved vary a little bit from drug to drug and disease to disease. But if someone, let's say that I had, so I've completed phase, my phase three study. And with drug A, and we look at the data, it always takes forever to get the results. So I can feel like you're always waiting on bated breath because they have to, get, have to vet the, the results and they're always blinded so we don't know until it's all done. Um, and we found drug A had you know, triple the response rate of serafinib and double the progression-free survival. I mean, let's say it just, just destroyed serafinib. I mean, that's, yeah, I would love to find that drug, that would be great. So, 
If that's the case, what the company then does is they submit to the FDA and they say, hey, FDA, we've got drug A. Here's our, to here's our side effect profile, we call it a toxicity profile. You know, here's the dosing plan. Here are the role of results of our phase one, our phase two, our phase three study. In that phase three study, we compared it to our standard of care drug, serafinib, and it did way better. So we would like the FDA to approve, us, to approve this drug to allow us to market it. And the FDA, if that were the case, I, with the drug that I've described, the FDA would give you an enthusiastic thumbs up, and then new drug A would be out in the marketplace. <laughs> no, nope, doesn't. Once something, it's actually, it's pretty uncommon for something to get pulled off the market. Uh, you can, there are a couple of cancer drugs, not in the thyroid cancer world, but there are a couple of cancer drugs I can think of where that happened. Um, maybe the most famous one recently is, uh, I don't know if you guys know, have heard of the medicine called Avastin. It's, a, it's an anti-blood uh, vessel medication that was approved to treat lung cancer and colon cancer. And for a period of time, it was approved to treat breast cancer. So there are some early studies that suggested uh, it had some benefit in breast cancer. The FDA approved it kind of conditionally. And then more studies came out, and the more studies that came out with Avastin and breast cancer, the less and less good it looked. And so the FDA actually revoked um, in that setting. But that's really uncommon. I mean, if new drug A were to come along, like I just described, serafinib would still be out there. I can't imagine they'd take it away. Standard of care, you know, so some, you know, let's kind of paint, paint a worst case scenario. Um, if someone were on serafinib and their cancer grew, you know, the, the next typical standard of care would, would actually probably be chemotherapy or trying to get one of these non-FDA approved for thyroid cancer drugs uh, approved by your, by your um, insurance company or your, whatever the payer source is. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. I know that in the phase one, there was about 400 people that were in that trial. Uh -huh. Seven of them were thyroid cancer patients. Right. And I know that there's seven, but is there any way to find out who those seven are? Because I want to know like what what their progress is yeah. right now, just because that's my specific. You know, and you, we, there, the sad answer is no. Unless, unless that person who was enrolled in said study wants to post it all over Facebook um, or something else. You know, what we are, you know, one, of, one of our jobs is, you know, I always, I always tell people when we enroll people in, in studies, you know, my number one job is always to take care of the person. And my secondary job is to take care of the study. And part of taking care of the patient is not spilling the beans about whatever their medical condition is. So if I have someone come in and I put them on a new drug and they have thyroid cancer and their thyroid cancer disappears, I mean, it would be terrific. You know, we're super excited. You know, they, they would be more than welcome to tell anyone they wanted to, but I couldn't say, hey, I know Sally Smith, and we have her on this drug, and, you know, because that would be a violation of HIPAA. Yeah, I meant, I meant more of, like, sorry. Oh, in terms of, like, long-term follow-up? Well, no, not even, like, the specific person, but, like, what they're, like, individually, how... How, how things have gone. How things have gone. So um, usually uh, there are a couple of different, uh, so I, I, I misunderstood your question, I got it now. So usually there are a couple of different venues to try to figure that out. So one is for drugs that are in development and haven't been, uh, we haven't published the manuscript, the scientific manuscript describing you know, what happened, um, how did everything go, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll present it at meetings, so ASCO or the you know, ACA meeting or something else. Um, and over, often those will have updates on how specific groups of patients are doing. Um, the other thing you can always do is if you go to clinical trial, I don't know if everyone's gone to clinicaltrials.gov. It's you know, clinicaltrials.gov. It's a website sponsored by, the, uh, by your tax dollars um, that basically lists all the registered phase two and phase three studies in the country. Um, it doesn't include all phase ones. But all phase twos and phase threes, it's required by law to post them there. And you can actually look it up and you can find, you know, it's clinicaltrials.gov. And so if you're looking for, you know, you want to learn what thyroid cancer studies are going on or, you know, your, your great aunt Sally has ovarian cancer and you want to see what else is out there, that's where you can look it all up. Um, so sometimes if you go to, I don't, I don't know who the, the principal investigator is for the study that you're on, but you can always ask them because sometimes they know. And, some, and sometimes they don't because it's, you know, the data 
get collected kind of on a rolling basis, but they only get analyzed at certain time points. So oftentimes, you know, particularly for something like that, where it's a, you know, it's a small percentage of the total population, you, you don't ever really know. Or you can't, it's hard to, you can, it's hard to figure out. Sometimes it's hard even on the investigator side to try to get some of those answers. Because, you know, we have the same questions. Hey, you know, there are these people that had, you know, five people had papillary thyroid cancer. How did they do? You know, sometimes it's hard to get that information. That's a really good question, though. So does this make sense? I will say there's something called phase four, which is basically after the drug has been approved, it's gone to market, it's being given to people. Um, that's, a, that's a study to basically seeing how things are working in the real world. So let's talk about the current landscape. Now, how many of, how many of us are Coloradans? Just one, two, okay. So does any of you, then I'm gonna pick on you. So do you know what this is or where this is? All right, Maroon Bells. There you go, you, you pass. Okay, well then you count. Um, so the Maroon Bells, so this is up by Aspen, which is beautiful. This is about 20 minutes or 20 feet from the parking lot, if you can believe it. Um, it's beautiful, it's the Maroon Bells. It's the most photographed place in, in Colorado. So this is the current landscape. So again, I, I, got, I do have some bad news. I am a medical oncologist. Um, you know, and that's that some people with differentiated thyroid cancers become radioactive iodine refractory. You know, it's, that's, I, I wish that were not the case because, man, this would be an easy talk to give. Uh, but it's just not, that's not the way it is. You know, medullary thyroid cancer, not treated with radioactive iodine, doesn't take up radioactive iodine, so that's not even a tool we have in our tool belt. And of course, anaplastic thyroid cancer has kind of limited standard options as, as things is. So, I mean, there's some bad news. So the good news is we have uh, several drugs that have been approved in the last three years to treat thyroid cancer, whereas the last drug to be approved to treat thyroid cancer was doxorubicin in the 70s. Um, there are new molecular pathways being identified that we can hopefully try to target. And then uh, there are a lot of uh, clinical trials that are ongoing or planned. So I think that, you know, while, you know, I would say historically, for people with radioactive iodine differ, uh, refractory thyroid cancer, we haven't had a ton of options. Um, I'm glad to say I think that's changing. So kind of along this, so this is a, you know, I, I am a, a medical, uh, you know, a medical researcher, so I have to have a couple of graphs. So we're going to have to deal with that. But basically, what this shows is that um, this is uh, publications. So how many public? When we go to our do our medical literature search, how many publications are there about you know about thyroid cancer? And you can see, you know, it's going up and up. Going just back, you know, ten years ago, when there was really not a whole heck of a lot at all. You know, now we're getting uh, many hundreds or even thousands of papers per year talking about what's going on in thyroid cancer. So I think this is encouraging. So we're gonna talk about a couple of different biological pathways. And I, I kind of lump them into a couple of categories. So I think about pathways and drugs that target blood vessels. I think about ones that work on the inside of cells. And then I think about ones that work not just on the inside of the cells, but in the nucleus, which is like the, the information center of the cell. All right, so here are some pathways. So I'm, we're, we're, we'll work our way through this. So this is a cell. I wonder if I can, okay, here we go. So this is a cell. This is, a, I don't know, you guys go back to high school biology or whatnot. Um, so if we think a cell is like a soccer ball or you know, some, a ball, this is the coding. These are these things called receptors that are stuck in the cell. They take information from outside and help translate it to go to the inside of the cells to tell the inside of the cell what to do. Um, and then this is the nucleus. That's like the main information center. That's where your DNA and your chromosomes and all that stuff are. And when we think about these things, you know, we like to make little easy boxes to say, you know, if this, then that, then that, then that, then that, because it makes it easier to, for us to figure out. So there are a couple of um, key things. So there's this thing called VEGF which is a vascular endothelial growth factor receptor. So that's a blood vessel one, vascular V, blood vessel. Uh, there's this thing I've abbreviated RTK, which is receptor tyrosine kinase. Basically what that is, is that something that sits in the cell or sits on the cell and information comes from outside. It says, ah, I recognize this information and it makes something happen on the inside of the cell. And then there's a specific one called uh, RET or PTC, uh, which is uh, much more common in medullary thyroid cancer. So I gave it a little special space. 
And then beyond that, there are a couple of different pathways, we call, that, that get activated. So one that some of you probably have heard of is this RAS, RAF, MAC, MAP kinase pathway, in part because BRAF is commonly mutated in uh, follicular and, uh, and uh, papillary thyroid cancer. And then there's this other one that is kind of a big actor, which is called PI3K AKT mTOR. So we'll come back to those. And then within the, uh, within the nucleus, there's something called PPAR gamma, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So these are kind of the big pathways. Now, of course, it's never the simple. Life is never the simple. So this would be, yeah. Absolutely. So um, this is, you know, a slightly more complicated version of one of those pathways, just to give you an idea that it's never as easy as we like to think. You know, it's never just A, B, C, D, E, we're done. It's always A interacts with Z, Z, R4, and it's, things go in circles, which is why sometimes even when something works perfectly in a, in a cell in a lab, and then you put that cell in a mouse, and it works perfectly in that cell in the mouse, when it gets to people, people are just more complicated, and the cancers are more complicated when they start in people. So it's never, it's never quite as easy as it looks. All right, so let's talk about uh, key pathways. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is this VEGF or vascular pathway, in part because that's where most of the data are. And the drugs that are approved, or the drugs that's approved, uh, for follicular or papillary is in this pathway. So let's talk about VEGFR. So, um, Ever, has everyone heard of serafinib or Nexavar or a couple people? So um, this is a, serafinib is a medication that's been a, around for maybe about 10 years or so. Uh, it first got approved to treat liver cancer and then kidney cancer. Um, and just recently got approved to treat thyroid cancer. So this is the study. So it was a serafinib for, for people with radioactive iodine refractory. So they, you know, people had gotten radioactive iodine, it just no longer worked. So you said, you know, the standard of care might be to watch or might need to, you know, do something else. So this is, in this situation, you know, the standard of care for people who are not terribly symptomatic might just be to watch them. So, you know, I you know, think your cancer is growing, but it's growing slowly. Let's, any of our therapies come with potential side effects, so let's hold off. So this study, actually what it did, it was a multinational study. Um, it compared people who got serafinib versus the people who got a placebo. So we didn't know who was who. And not that you guys have to be uh, experts in reading the medical literature, but I think that this, these two figures point out something interesting. So the first thing is we talked about that thing called progression-free survival, which is basically how long did it take for someone's cancer to get worse? And you know, I wish the answer here was it took forever. Everyone's cancer just stayed you know, the same and never grew, but that was not the case. But what did happen is th this is this top line red, these are the people who got serafinib, and the people in the blue were people who uh, got uh, placebo. And there's, you see, there's a distinction in that uh, everything that's shifted to the right suggests it just took longer for things to get worse for people who got serafinib. Serafinib did not cure people from thyroid cancer, unfortunately, but it did slow things down, or in some cases shrink things enough that people felt better, their tumors were slowed down um, than people who were taking placebo. In the bottom right, you see an, another funny looking uh, figure which I think is pretty interesting. So the way that this works, remember we talked about you know, how we measure these things. So I get a CAT scan, I put you know, these virtual calipers on a tumor, another tumor, another tumor, we do up to five. And then you sum them up and you say, how much is it in total? And you do it at different time points, you know, three months, five, six months, it depends on the study. So that's what this shows. So I'll, so if we, if I can find my, so, so this is, you know, amount of, uh, of tumor shrinkage or growth. So if it's 0%, that means the tumor didn't do anything. It didn't grow, didn't shrink, it was identical in terms of measurements. Anything below the line suggests that things shrunk. Anything above the line means that things grew. And this is, a, this is, a, this is when we do these studies, this thing is called a waterfall plot. Uh, we, this is kind of how, thing, how things were at the best. So if you look in the red, again, the red is serafinib. So you, know, you don't need to be a medical oncologist to see that you know, the response rate 
Remember that kind of 30, you know, how many people's tumors shrunk by 30% or more? The response rate in the study was only 12%, which is, you know, so not a huge number, one out, one out of eight people. However, if you look at the study itself, clearly more than one out of eight people's cancer shrunk. Just not one out of eight people's cancer, only one out of eight people's cancer met that kind of 30% arbitrary cutoff that we used. I think the other thing that's really interesting about this study, though, is this, this study was, it was very well done in that they picked people who clearly didn't have radioactive iodine uh, sensitive disease, and you had to show on CAT scans that your tumors were getting worse. They had to be getting bigger off therapy. And even in this group, which is kind of the worst of the worst of a lot of people with thyroid cancer, some people's cancers shrunk on placebo. So even in that situation where we kind of selected for people that have worse cancers, some cancers didn't get worse at all, and just watching them was as effective as probably serafinib was, which I just think is an interesting thing and goes into how complicated it is to decide whether to, make, whether to try one of these medications, and if so, how well do they work. So common serafinib side effects, so you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and serafinib does not qualify as a free lunch, either financially or in terms of side effects. So side effects, the big ones, there are a number. The big ones, it causes this thing called the hand foot syndrome, or plantar pulmonary erythrodesthesia. So basically, people's hands get sore, and you can get kind of skin thickening, it can get cracking, uh, it can be very uncomfortable and painful. Uh, so that's the biggest potential side effect. Um, next, it can cause diarrhea. About 60% of people in the study got diarrhea of some degree or another. Um, it can cause hair loss, not necessarily going completely bald, uh, but it can cause people's hair to thin. So it, those are probably the big three side effects that we see. It can do things in terms of, it can affect people's blood counts and liver tests, and uh, it, can, uh, it can impair people's heart function and all sorts of, I mean, it comes with a lot of potential side effects. But these are the, probably the big ones, yeah. The hand foot is a real bugaboo with these medications. So you know, we tell people to um, moisturize because you know, that's a that's a big thing. Sometimes if they get real thickened, uh, you can use exfoliant creams to try to get some of that thickening off. Um, but we don't have any really great things to prevent it. So I mean, the diarrhea, quite frankly, is easier to treat because we have effective anti-diarrheal medications. But for all the VEGF inhibitors. Um, this is the, the hand foot is a problem. So for serafinib, it's, it's worse than it is for some other medications. Yeah? Was there any correlation to how well the drug was working and having the side effects? That is a terrific question, and the answer is no. But it's a, but it's a great question, because we, we see that with some of the other things. Really? Yeah? She's asking me, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. I've been on Sutan okay. for two months now. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so every, right, so every, you know, everyone's different. So I will say even in serafinib, so, you know, when, you, I, when I think of medications, I, I clump them into groups. So, you know, there are the VEGF TKI, so Sutent is one, serafinib, pazopinib, axitinib, all these things that end in IB. And even though they're all kind of in the same family of medications, they do have some unique properties or different characteristics. So let's say Sutent is not as bad in terms of the, uh, as the hand foot as serafinib is. They just, they, they just have different side effects. So the fact that you didn't have, you're not having any, I would say that's great because it's not a fun thing to have, but it, does, but it doesn't have any effect on whether that medication will or will not be working. Mm -mm. Yeah. So I exactly. So I wouldn't. Um, I would not necessarily be concerned about it. It's working or not working based upon whether you have that. Sure. Um, I will say there's a new kid on the block. Uh, it's going back to my youth. You remember new kids on the block? Maybe not. So um, at ASCO, which is our big medical oncology meeting, this past summer there was a, a new study that pre presented called the Select Study. Uh, which is a new tyrosine kinase inhibitor called lenvatinib uh, that got compared uh, to uh, a placebo. So the study design is very similar to that decision study that got the serafinib approved. So it basically took similar patients, patients with uh, radioiodine refractory, differentiated thyroid cancer, 
that was getting worse on with evidence on CAT scan and compared this new medication, lenvatinib versus placebo. And they said, well, what happens? And I don't have a figure, but the response rates so that kind of arbitrary tumor shrinkage measure was actually, it was really high, it's about 65%. Um, and that progression-free survival, how long it took for people's cancers to get worse was fairly long. So I, this drug has been um, submitted to the FDA for approval. Um, we don't know if and when the, we don't know when the uh, decision will come from the FDA about whether this medicine will get approved or not. Um, but I think it was a very exciting study. And that's, VEGF. that's another VEGF inhibitor. So there are all these, so here's a couple, a, a list of uh, a number of different VEGF uh, tyrosine kinase uh, TKIs. So these are uh, studies that have been completed. So there's serafinib, that study's been done, FDA approved. You say there, you know, had 400 plus patients, which is a good number for any uh, cancer study, quite frankly. The response rate, so that everything shrunk by 30% or more, was only about 12%. Progression-free survival, so it was about 11 months, even for people on the study, before their cancers got um, subjectively bigger. Uh, so that's, that's what we got. So the lenvatinib, that's the other thing I've, I have in kind of darker gray. So that's another phase three study. So remember we talked about phase ones, phase twos, phase threes. So this is, these are the two that have compared it to standard of care, which was watching. Uh, and in that one, the response rate was way higher, 63%. Uh, and the progression-free survival was 18.2 months. Now, does that mean that lenvatinib is a better medication than serafinib? Not necessarily. It'd be easy to kind of look at that and make a quick conclusion that that's the case. But the studies were done a little bit differently. They had slightly different patient populations. So you can't, sometimes it's hard to compare study versus study in that setting. But I think it's, it's a pretty exciting um, new medication and I would, I'm, I look forward to hearing what the FDA has to say about it. Yeah. You know, the lenvatinib has less hand foot uh, and a little bit more diarrhea. So those are probably the, the big things. Uh, 18.2. So then there are a bunch of other VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been tested in phase two. So again, that's, you know, we knew this, kind of knew the safety profile and the drug dosing range from phase one. And we said, well, we know, veg, we know VEGF uh, therapies are potentially exciting for thyroid cancer. Let's try these drugs in thyroid cancer. So and this, these, are, these are always kind of a mishmash of differentiated thyroid cancers. So they might be, um, you know, 50% papillary, 30% follicular, you know, 10% Herthel cell, you know, 5% insular carcinomas, and 5% medullaries or something like that. So it's always, you know, it, it, they, they all get lumped together in a lot of these studies. So looking at things like so axitinib, uh, which is approved to treat kidney cancer, pizopinib, which is also approved to pre treat kidney cancer and sarcomas, uh, sutent, uh, or sunitinib, which is approved to treat kidney cancer and, and neuroendocrine cancer, so the pancreas and some other things. So again, you can see the numbers are always smaller in terms of the number of patients that were involved. And the response rates are somewhere, again, in that 14 to 40, you know, 50% range. Broad strokes depend probably not just on drug, but who actually got enrolled in the study or not, and progression-free survival. So they're all kind of in the same neighborhood. So there's a lot of them out there, and I think for many of our patients, you know, if they try, if, they're not interested in the clinical study, uh, or they're not in a place where they are, can participate in the clinical study, and they try serafinib and that doesn't work. You know, oftentimes you can you, you can try to get one of these other medications based on the idea of here's a phase two study. This is how things went. We know this is a safe drug because we've used it with many thousands of people with other diseases, you know, and see if we can get it. So does that make sense? So that's the VEGF kind of story. There are a couple. Um, I, will, I will put a plug in for, for two other things. There, there are these two other drugs called thalidomide and lenalidomide, which have very confusing ways that, that they work. And that we sometimes, I'll be honest, I think sometimes we as a medical community think we know what they do and then we get kind of faked out and find out we're wrong. So thalidomide, many of you guys may have heard of because this was originally used as a, an anti-nausea medication back in the 60s and it caused a lot of birth defects in, in children. So it got, uh, put it on the shelf, you know, rightfully so, for many, many years. And then people discovered it worked really well for this kind of blood cancer called multiple myeloma. And subsequently, it's been tested in all sorts of different things, including thyroid cancer. So thalidomide and its, uh, its uh, I would say, daughter medication, lenalidomide, work in part by 
disrupting the ability to make new blood vessels. And so there was a study of lenalidomide, where they gave it to people, again, same story, radioactive iodine refractory thyroid cancer. And there was a pretty impressive shrinkage rate, you know, somewhere around 40% with this medication. This is a medication that we use all the time to treat, thyro or to treat uh, multiple myeloma and some other blood cancers. So it's, a, it's got a, a well-known safety profile. So that's, uh, I think, something else that's out there. So and what we'll, I figure what we do is we talk about, for what? So it, only in study. So in terms of some studies that are out there that are looking at these types of drugs. So there's one study of a medication called sidirinib, which is another of these VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like all the other ones I just listed. Um, and it's a study of that plus or minus lenalidomide. So that's a study that's ongoing right now. Uh, it's, everyone gets sidirinib because we think the odds of that working, similar to all the other VEGF tyrosine kinase inhibitors, is, is high. And then the question is, does adding something else make things better? So half the people will get lenalidomide, half the people don't. But everyone gets sidirinib, which I think all of us feel very comfortable with. So this is, a, this is sponsored by the National Cancer Institute. It's a phase two study. Um, it's open, uh, the main site is the University of Chicago, but we, I know we have it open here. Um, it's open at Mayo, MD Anderson, USC, a couple of other places. But those are at least covers the middle of the country and, and the sides. There's a study of serafinib, so uh, it's already approved, plus or minus a new, med a different medication called Everolimus, which works in a pathway we'll just talked about. That's a phase two study. It's being run uh, by the Alliance for Clinical Trials, which is a National Cancer Institute sponsored cooperative group. So this is a study that will be available probably more broadly than some of these other ones. There's a medicine called cabozantinib, uh, which works in part on uh, VEGF. Uh, this is a medicine that's approved to treat medullary thyroid cancer, which we'll talk about in a little bit. That's open at a number of places, Mayo, MGH. Uh, Dr. Worth was just in here, the, the speaker before me at MGH, uh, Chicago, MD Anderson, Ohio State, et cetera. So there's a couple of things out there uh, in the VEGF world for thyroid cancers, which I think are pretty interesting. Like I said, and I know the one that we have here in Denver um, is the sidirinib plus or minus lenalidomide study. So uh, in terms of key clinical pathways, so this is you know, cell signaling. So we just talked about VEGF. So now we're going to talk about more what's going on on the inside of the cells. And this is, I think, particularly interesting because you know, the, in oncology, what we're trying to do more of is identify specific mutations in people's cancers and say, what's a drug against that specific mutation, as opposed to just saying, you know, everyone's the same, so we're just going to give everyone the same thing. We're trying to say, what's unique about this person's cancer? How can we treat that unique thing about the cancer? So in this signaling pathway, so RAS, about 40%, including peripheral cells, um, get, uh, have mutations in the scene called RAS. Slightly downstream of it, BRAF, you know, it's about 30% of folliculars, about 50% of papillary thyroid cancer. So there's a pretty, you know, either a slight majority in the case of uh, when you, the, pen, the study you look at, papillary thyroid cancers, but a significant minority, regardless, of these cancers have these specific mutations, which makes us think, well, maybe we can look at drugs that look at that specific mutation, target that specific mutation, and maybe those will work better. So none of these are approved to treat thyroid cancer. So these are all clinical studies that have been done, um, and they're all phase twos, right? So these are all, we know the drug, we know the safety profile, we know the dosing, but we don't know if it works in thyroid cancer. So we'll go through a couple of these. So there's a medicine called Everolimus. This is a medicine that we use to treat uh, kidney cancer. It targets this thing called mTOR, which is actually here. And small study, 38 patients. That kind of arbitrary response rate was 5%, uh, was which is not great. Um, Progression-free survival, again, around a year. There's a medicine called Jafitinib, which is a medicine we use to treat certain lung, lung cancers, which Looked kind of interesting, but truthfully didn't work. I put it up there because people tried it, but I would I have less than zero enthusiasm about this particular drug. Um, Vandetinib, which is a medicine that we use to treat medullary thyroid cancer. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh huh. How can you have a zero response rate? That's a great question. So the response rate, remember, is only if things shrink by this kind of arbitrary 30% number. So if things shrink, uh, uh, or alternatively, you know, if they grow by less than 20%, there's this big middle ground, which we call stable disease, which, you know, it's, it's, it's oncology jargon more than anything. But if someone 
is in that realm. So it's, if you check a CAT scan at two months, their cancer grew by 10%. We'd call it stable. And they will have not yet progressed. Now for the next CAT scan, it's grown by another 12%. So now we're at, we're at 22% growth. At that point, it's crossed the arbitrary border of 20%. And we say, oh, OK, this is, this is now progression. So you can, you can not be progressing technically, but not have any significant improvement in your, in your cancer. Does that make sense? OK. That's a great question. So there's this other thing called vandetinib, which is a medicine that's approved to treat medullary thyroid cancer. This is non-medullary thyroid cancer. This is you know, follicular, papillary, et cetera. Um, response rates, again, were pretty small. And that's, that, should, that should be 5.7, not 57. 57 would be great. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's not, um, unfortunately, none of these meds are, are you know, like I said, a free lunch. Yeah, and Vend Vendetinib is no different from the rest of them in terms of its side effect profile, which is why, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, trying to carefully weigh with patients, you know, here's, here's what we expect to happen in terms of side effects. Are we, in, are we really in a spot where we feel like we need to use these medications? Because, you know, while surgery is no fun, and radiation is no fun, and radioactive iodine is no fun, you know, these those things, the side effects often kind of come and go a little bit more. You have surgery, you recuperate. With these things, it, they just kind of drag out. So it's, you, know, you have to be careful in terms of choosing when, when to use them. Yeah. Well, in that study, mm -hmm. that's one that's been something, especially for, for cancer, that mm -hmm. you know, it's been around for a long time. And it's been Yeah, so this is, uh, we'll, we'll talk about what's coming, what's, what's open and what's coming up. This is what's already been done. And I can't, I'll tell you, I don't remember uh, in that particular study what fraction of people had Herthel cell carcinomas. Herthel cells are, uh, so Herthel cells are in the family of follicular uh, uh, thyroid cancers. And they, we think that there's more importance in Herthel cells in this pathway, this PI3K AKT mTOR pathway, which is why maybe Everolimus, which works right here, might be a little bit more effective in that path, in that setting. Um, the three drugs or the three studies on the bottom, I think, are, uh, are something I get asked about a lot. So, as we said, a lot of people have mutations in this thing called BRAF, which is this, you know, signaling kinase uh, intracellularly. And we know, uh, so BRAF mutations are actually really common across a lot of different cancers. So the one that we actually think about the most is, a, is uh, the skin cancer melanoma. So many people with melanoma have this mutation in, in, uh, in BRAF, and so a couple of drugs have been developed against that mutation. And when used in, uh, in melanoma, they're terrifically effective for a short period of time, albeit, but they're terrifically effective in terms of causing significant improvements in people's quality of life and tumor sizes and just, you know, they're good drugs in that setting. So the question has been using these similar medications or the same medications, and people who have a similar kind of mutation in thyroid cancer, do they work as well? So there have been, um, I would say, three studies that have looked at this or are looking at this. Uh, so there's a medicine called dabrafenib. It's nice because you know, they include RAF, which is what they target right in the name. Um, the tumor shrinkage rate you know, with dabrafenib, this is for people with that specific mutation, it's around 33%. I think you'll find it's pretty similar with the vemurafenib, 33, you know, tw somewhere around 30%. Uh, when progression-free survival rates you know, either not reported yet or somewhere, you know, seven to 15 months. So I think there's a signal that these could be good medications in this setting. We'll need to have another one of those big phase three studies where you compare it against either serafinib or standard of care or whatnot to figure out if it's actually, you know, as good as we hope it will be. But that, I think, is, um, I think that's a drug that you will hear more about for people with differentiated thyroid cancers and RAF mutations. So there are a couple of them out there. I know there are two um, that are enrolling right now. So there's this one called dabrafenib plus lapatinib, which is a different one. This is a phase one study. So we, going back, we talked about the different kinds of studies. So we don't actually know how well these drugs play together in terms of side effects. So this is um, the group at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, are trying to figure out you know, the answer to that question first before we even know whether these things would work together to treat thyroid cancer. Another study, uh, again, dabrafenib plus or minus this other thing called a MEK inhibitor, which is you know, if we go back to that, to that drawing, I have you know, something on the left, something in the middle. So this actually blocks both. 
potentially. So if, you, if we're blocking both, maybe we're more effective. Um, this is a combination that is used in melanoma. So we know that it's safe, um, but we don't know if it's effective. And we know that the more drugs that you add, often you know, the more side effects you have. So uh, the goal is always to try to get the most bang for your buck with the least amount of side effects. So this is a study I think that's pretty interesting uh, for people with BRAF and, uh, mutations. I will say, I think there's, there's, a, there's a really special, potentially a special feature about these things called MEK inhibitors, which are in that, those same pathways, and that there's some suggestion that you might be able to take people from being radioactive iodine refractory and turning them back into radioiodine sensitive, which would be pretty cool. Because, I mean, these medications, like when you take them for a long period of time, are not the most fun on earth. And radioactive iodine is not the most fun on earth, but it's, you know, you get treated, you recuperate, and then you kind of go back to living your life as opposed to taking meds every day. So the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering did a study where um, they gave people this MEK inhibitor called selumetinib. They had to basically be radioactive iodine refractory at first, gave them this medication, and then checked to see whether people were, were radioiodine sensitive again. And a minority, but an, I think an important minority of people became radioiodine sensitive again and could get retreated with radioactive iodine, people who weren't able to get treated uh, at that time. So, you know, I think it's a small single center study and we always, whenever time, you know, no matter how, any, how great any of our single centers are, you know, they're all, it's harder to apply something from one institution broadly, but I think this is a very exciting thought um, and it's something that is going to be tested in a, in a much more kind of formal broad sense uh, through ITOG, which is the Inter International Thyroid Oncology Group, with a study of selumetinib, or radioactive iodine plus or minus selumetinib within probably the next year or two, depending on how things go. So that's, uh, that's something to keep your eyes open for. There are a couple other things that are out there that I think are, yeah? No, the ASTRA study is different. So the ASTRA study is um, for people who have uh, differentiated thyroid cancer and have surgery and are, are need radioactive iodine afterwards to try to decrease their chances that the cancer comes back. The study, the ASTRA study takes that same drug, selumetinib, and it says everyone gets radioactive iodine. And then it randomizes people to get selumetinib plus radioactive iodine or just radioactive iodine. So the, in, the difference here is, you know, this is not, this is not the curative and setting. You know, these are people whose cancers have either come back or sometimes come back several times. And we're just hoping to delay things or, you know, improve their quality of life and, you know, put things at bay for as long as possible. The ASTRA study is to say we're trying to cure more people of cancer by hopefully making their cancers right after surgery more sensitive to, to radioactive iodine. So same drugs, same, you know, radioactive iodine, but the goal and the patients are a little bit different. This, so this one was done at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. And like I said the ITOG, uh, ITOG is doing a study very similar to this that will be rolling out at m many of the ITOG centers in the next year or two. Um, there are a couple of things that are uh, off the beaten path that I think are worth talking about. So rosiglitazone and pioglitazone are both diabetes medications. Um, and they work by targeting this thing called PPAR gamma. And if we think back to the, uh, um, to my little drawing, there's that PPAR gamma was in the nucleus. That's a nuclear feature. And there, people observed that some people who are taking these medications with thyroid cancer seem to be doing better with their thyroid cancer than people who weren't you know, diabetics who were on this medication. They have. So there was a study uh, that said, well, what, let's use it to treat thyroid cancer and see what the heck happens. So small study, only 20 people. It was mostly papillary thyroid cancer. Gave people uh, rosiglitazone. And again, that arbitrary response rate was 25%, which is pretty good when you compare it to, you know, all those other medications that we were talking about. Subsequently, um, on, you know, its neighbor medication, pioglitazone, is uh, being evaluated right now for people who have translocations or, you know, mutations in that particular gene, so PPAR gamma. So the idea is, hey, if we can find, so this is mostly going to be follicular cancer patients or follicular slash papillary overlaps. So for people who have follicular cancer and have this mutation, how frequently the mutation is, I'll tell you very widely, depending on what study you look at. 
can you treat, can you treat him with a diabetes, a diabetes medication? No, certainly, no, certainly I will tell you if, if a diabetes, diabetes medication, medication works as well as serafinib, I can tell you the side, side effect profile will be a lot, a lot better with this particular, with this particular medication than serafinib. This, 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 this is a really, really interesting, interesting idea. Uh, 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 run at the University of Michigan, Michigan Science. Science. I, know I know that we have, that we have here, here uh, we have it open at Ohio State, State. Um, and, and then, and then it's, it's, uh, it's in the process of opening up a couple other But I think, but I think for people like Hiller and 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 there are some other things that you might read about. There are some things called ALK, which is indicated in a minority differentiated in a classic thyroid cancer. We have two drugs that are FDA approved to treat ALK for ALK mutated lung cancers. Something called NTRAC, which is a lot of interest in one of my colleagues at the University of Colorado. TGF beta I put on there twice because it's so important. So we talked about a couple of these key pathways. You know. And with other cancers, so I will uh, spend a couple of moments to talk about medullary thyroid cancer and anaplastic thyroid cancer. So for medullary thyroid cancer, you know, it's a thyroid cancer, but it's not like normal thyroid cells. It's these things called neuroendocrine cells of the thyroid. So they don't have any response to iodine. You know, you can't suppress someone's TSH and hopefully put things at bay. They're kind of totally different beasts. What is interesting is we have, we have two drugs that are approved to treat this medication. So there's one called vandetinib. Uh, which is, uh, goes by the TV name Calpressa. And then we have one uh, called Cabozantinib, which goes by the TV name uh, Cometric. They are both VEGF medicine, so they work on blood vessels. But they also uh, target something called RET, which is mutated uh, very frequently in medullary thyroid cancer. So uh, again, using one of these, you know, call them, uh, Michaelis Menten plot, I'm uh, sorry, one of these, a Kaplan Myers plots. You'll see people, and this is a study, you know, a phase three randomized study where people either got placebo or they got the study medicine. Everyone in red is people who got the study medicine. This is from the cabozantinib study. The people in blue are people who got placebo. And you can see there's a big difference. Again, anything shifted to the right are people who uh, took longer for their cancers to, to grow. Uh, so it was based on this that the cabozantinib or cometric got approved. Uh, to treat medullary thyroid cancer. There's a very similar plot that I could have showed you for the vantetinib study uh, with medullary thyroid cancer. There are, for medullary thyroid cancer, there are a couple of things out there that are a little bit different from the other uh, thyroid cancer studies that are going on. We have reasons to think that medullary thyroid cancer does well with the other VEGF inhibitors, whether it's serafinib or sinitinib or pizopinib or any of those other IBs. So I didn't, I didn't include those up here. There are a couple of those that are unique to medullary thyroid cancer. So that at the National Cancer Institute, um, there's an, uh, an actual vaccine study that's being done. It's trying to harvest people's immune systems to attack medullary thyroid cancer. Um, that's with a, a, a vaccine that is actually out of, you know, as, as a native Colorado, and I have to have you know, Colorado pride when we have it. Uh, there's a, a pharmaceutical company called Globe Immune that's based in La, Lafayette. Uh, that is uh, making this drug. So that's open at the uh, National, Institute, uh, National Cancer Institute. There's a similar study that opened in France, um, if any of you are French or want to go, um, that the idea is the same. There's a medicine called passeriotide, which works on somatostatin, which is this other hormone that's often involved in, in, in neuroendocrine cancers, uh, plus or minus everolimus, which is a drug we've seen before. So that's open in a number of sites. And then there's a medicine called panatinib, which we use to treat kind of a chronic a form of chronic leukemia, which suggests there are some suggestions that it might be helpful in this setting. So there are a couple of things going on for medullary. You know, for anal anaplastic thyroid cancer, um, it's we're not doing quite so, quite as hot, and there's a lot of hard work ahead of us. I'd say so. We know for anaplastics, there are a bunch of other you know these key features: RAS, BRAF, PI3K, and then something called P, uh, P53, which is like the king of uh, of oncogenes uh, or cancer-causing genes. So there are a bunch of things going on um, for anaplastic thyroid cancer. You know, for the longest time, we've not really had anything, and you know, I think uh, many of us would argue we don't have a, we still don't have a ton. But there are a couple of studies that are going on to try to figure out well, what are new options available for people with anaplastic thyroid cancer. So I've put, posted a couple of them here. Some of them use similar ideas to what we've just seen. So. This uh, study drug from Millennium, the L L MLN0128, targets mTOR. We've heard about mTOR, it's everolimus. 
There's a uh, study uh, sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, uh, so through the cooperative groups network that is looking at radiation plus chemotherapy plus pazopinib, which is another one of these VEGF inhibitors. Uh, Crolibulin is a vascular disrupting agent that's open at the NCI. Um, and then paclitaxel plus a flutazone is going to be another one of these genes that's open through the National Cancer Institute's cooperative uh, trial network. So I think there are some things out there uh, to, to try to look at uh, anaplastic thyroid cancer. And hopefully we'll be better at enrolling these ones than we have some of the other anaplastic thyroid studies. So I guess with that, um, I'll say, you know, we're identifying a lot of new targets, which I think is key. You know, ultimately the goal will be for people who have radioiodine refractory thyroid cancer are in a spot where we got to start thinking about other medications. Ultimately, our hope will be, let's look at you, let's look at your cancer, let's identify what mutations you may or may not have, let's see if we can find something that targets that specific mutation. If we can, great. If we can't, you know, what else do we have available? You know, I think there are a lot of, you know, thankfully there are a lot of studies going on right now in kind of all different histologies, papillary, follicular, medullary, anaplastic, erythral cell, et cetera, uh, to help try to figure that out. So with that, I'll say thanks and stay and answer whatever questions you guys have. Not the, uh, not that I know of, um, at least not in the clinical trial field. I don't. I mean, I don't know what there is. I would say in terms of the basic science side, but not to my knowledge in terms of, uh, in terms of clinical studies. That's a good question, though. Yes, yeah, so you know, oftentimes when someone, so anaplastic thyroid cancer, uh, if you, oftentimes when someone has a, a anaplastic thyroid, they're an anaplastic thyroid cancer, if someone gets a thyroidectomy, oftentimes if, you're, if you have a, a, a good thyroid pathologist, he or she will be able to look at the sample and we'll be able to find underlying papillary thyroid cancer, or underlying follicular thyroid cancer, suggesting that what happened is that someone had one of these better differentiated thyroid cancers and it kind of degenerated over time. Now, it's not, I mean, thankfully it's not very common, uh, but certainly that's the thought is that anaplastic thyroid cancers actually derive from a more differentiated form of thyroid cancer. That said, you know, someone who's had papillary thyroid cancer and they've had papillary thyroid cancer for 15 years, you know, it's not terribly common for that to all of a sudden undergo uh, a rapid transformation and become anaplastic. It can become more poorly differentiated, which is kind of the middle step. You know, you have papillary, poorly differentiated, anaplastic. So that transition happens not infrequently, but going all the way to anaplastic is pretty uncommon. That is a great question. So the the answer is so I mean I have to, so my academic hat always says of course because we'd like to know. Um, my practical hat, which is often tends to be a little bit bigger, um, is that you know right now we don't have any any drugs approved to treat BRF specific thyroid cancer. I would say if one is considering a, a clinical study or you want you know, to look at one in, in your uh, region, I think that would be a reasonable thing to test. But you know, the, the problem is it's not, always, um, it's not always covered by people's insurance. And I, I, it's a hard thing for me to tell people to eat the cost for because it, it, it can be a couple hundred bucks. Um, that said, um, I think it can be, a, it, it certainly I think gives us a little bit of prognostic information, but it might open a lot of uh, trial options for people who are interested. Hmm. Yes. So, um, what do you do if you are on one of these drugs and some of your cancer is being responsive to it and others are not? So, I have um, papillary uh -huh. metastasis I have in my lungs, in my bones. Mm -hmm. um, I take serafinib and I take Zomeda. Okay. Um, while being on those, I have developed a tumor in my liver. Okay. Okay. That is a great question, and the answer is no one is entirely certain. So what many of us will do is, 
uh, if someone is on one of these medications and they're, and it's, this is not in the setting of a clinical study because the rules are all different in clinical studies. But someone's on serafinib, their thyroid cancer kind of globally is actually doing pretty well. Um, but there are specific areas that are problematic. Sometimes what we'll use is we'll use focal radiation therapy. Uh, yeah. So that, it's still something that you could, you know, that we would consider. I mean, the other thing is you could, you can always, you know, particularly if they're symptomatic, you, you can, there are all sorts of interesting radiation or even surgical techniques um, to try to make some of those things better. Um, because we don't, and at the same time, we don't want to toss a, a good medication otherwise. Um, Yeah. So is there add You know, the problem is with adding, with adding, so A, nothing is approved to, to do it. So adding another VEGF inhibitor, let's say going on serafinib and Sutent, um, would, I, I think, would be, just, would be miserable um, in terms of the side effects. So I, I would not be overly enthusiastic about that. I think, you know, we tend to focus more on, on local therapies for specific areas that seem to be getting worse. You know, you can, switching medications can sometimes do it, but what you, you bring up as, as a real problem in therapy, so you know, what we think of, I think, you think about cancer is almost like a tree. You know, so at the, tr at the roots of the tree or at the base of the tree was whatever the initial problem was, so whatever the initial mutation was. But as things grow and divide and differentiate, they take their own little paths. So you might have this branch that is very sensitive to serafinib. But, you know, and that's, you know, in your case, it sounds like maybe in the liver, or and sorry, in the lungs. But then, you know, this branch, which then ended up going to the bones and to the liver and to the skull base, you know, this is not in that serafinib sensitive path. We don't have great ways right now of taking that, taking that, aside from just saying, well, what's the general bulk? Most of the stuff is doing pretty well with the serafinib therapy. Let's try to do local therapies here if we can. Yeah. You know, and if, and, and, you know, there comes a point where you, it's hard to keep doing that, and sometimes switching is, is the way to go. Yeah, but there's, there's not a more rigorous scientific explanation, unfortunately. That's a tough spot to be in. Anything else? Right, well, thanks for uh, paying attention. Thank you. Yep.